Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you and good to be with you again. Been looking forward to this opportunity and uh, just excited about what God is doing in the earth today. Excited about what he's doing in my life. I don't know why I'm his favorite child. I just am. Uh, he makes me feel that way. He's been so good to me. And I trust that's the way you feel as well. How many of you can say this morning, God has been good to me? Well, why don't you go ahead and lift that other hand and praise him and thank him for his goodness. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I am thrilled to have my wife with me today. Uh, yes, Carolyn, stand up. Let them all see you. Amen. Next month, we will be celebrating 47 years of marriage. 47. I was six and she was four when we married. <laughs> uh, we've known each other all of our lives, almost all of our lives. We uh, actually grew up on the same street. We met each other when I was 11 and she was nine, and that's when she fell in love with me. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And uh, we've been together ever since, and uh, we have two wonderful daughters who blessed us with seven grandchildren. And uh, our oldest grandchild is 23, just recently married, and uh, one of our grandchildren is with us on this trip, her very first time to be in the UK, and she is Madison, and she is 14 and a half. That half <laughs> is important. Madison, would you stand and give my granddaughter Madison a good hand? <laughs> Amen. I'm 66 and a half, but you can forget the half if you want to, okay? Praise the Lord. Got your Bibles with you today? I'd like for you to open them, first of all, to Psalm 5, Psalm 5. One of my greatest desires, and I say this with all my heart, is that God's people experience God's best. One of the things that grieves my heart the most is to see so many of God's people living beneath their privileges as covenant people. I travel the world and have for many, many years now. I see the body of Christ on a very large scale. And it's worldwide plague, you might say, a lack of knowledge in God's people. And God's word says that His people perish for a lack of knowledge. I like to say it this way. They, they don't enjoy his best. For a lack of knowledge. There's so much more in store. Than what most of us realize. And it's not all about. Prosperity financially. It's not all about houses. And cars and all of that. Even though it's part of it. Uh, I guess you have noticed by now. That it's just impossible. To live on this planet without money. Anybody noticed that yet? You just can't live on this planet without this thing called money. And, of course, God knows that, and he's certainly not against you having some. In fact, he's not against you having much, just as long as you keep your priorities straight. And he's number one. Amen. He is number one. When he's number one in your life, there is no limit to where he will take you. And what he will do in your life. I'm living proof of that. Uh, I'm celebrating my 44th year of ministry. And in those 44 years, God has taken me from glory to glory. He's taken me from increase to increase. Uh, God's never done less for me. He keeps doing more for me. In fact, Psalm 115 says that the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your family, you and your children, because His blessing is upon our lives. Forty-four years ago when I began this walk, I knew nothing about the Scripture. Oh, I'd heard John 3.16 like most people had. I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad were Christian people. They took us to church, my sister and I. They took us to church every Sunday. 
And uh, like many young children who grew up in church, we went to church, but we didn't know anything. I don't remember my mom and dad talking a whole lot about the Scripture in our house. They, they, they loved God, and they talked about God from time to time. And, uh, you know, they saw to it that we were raised in a godly atmosphere. But as far as us discussing the Scripture, I don't remember that happening too often. I don't remember them ever using the word covenant in our home. We didn't know anything about our covenant. I was shocked to find out that the word testament and covenant were one and the same. Old Testament. I'd heard that. New Testament. I'd heard that. But had no idea that it meant covenant. The only time I'd ever heard the word covenant was on television. Watching cowboys and Indians programs. The Indians made blood covenants with one another. I remember watching as a kid the Indians, you know, piercing their finger or their wrist and mingling their blood. And I thought that's the coolest thing I ever saw in my life. So my best friend and I, we were covenant brothers. I was Tonto and I don't remember what his name was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and as far as a covenant with God, I never heard anything like that before. And it was not until 1969. When a man named Kenneth Copeland came to our city where Carol and I lived and where at that time I owned an automotive business. Knew I had the call of God on my life, but did not want to preach the gospel. That was the furthest thing from my desires and wants. And, um, but when this man came and preached the gospel like I'd never heard before, I couldn't run anymore. I shut my business down, began preparing for the ministry that I knew God had called me to many, many years before. Going into that guest bedroom in our home, our spare bedroom, with a Bible, a legal pad, a notebook, and seven reel-to-reel -reel tapes. This is prior MP3, <laughs> CD, even cassette. Back then, they were reel-to-reel -reel tapes, had a message on each side. You didn't carry your tape player around with you. It was this big. You set it on a credenza, on a table, on a desk. You attached the speakers to it. And you put the tape on, and you ran it through the head, and then you put it on an empty spool, and you turned it on, and you listened. And if you didn't understand, thank God for that stop button. Thank God for reverse or rewind. Most of the time, I was on rewind all the time because I didn't understand anything. If they said, open your Bibles to Ephesians, I stopped them because I had no clue where Ephesians was. And I found Ephesians. Thank God for a table of contents. <laughs> and then I'd turn him back on to hear what he had to say. I didn't understand that, so I stopped, rewound, made him say it again. And I made him say it again and again and again and again until I got it. And one of the first things that God began to teach me was on our covenant and on the blessing of God and on the favor of God. I'd never heard subjects like this before. Uh, Kenneth Copeland began to introduce me to, through his teachings, the ministry of Kenneth Hagin. And I began to get all the material and resources I could from Kenneth Hagin's ministry. One of the first little books that I remember reading from Kenneth Hagin was Right and Wrong Thinking. It changed my life. And then I got a little book by Kenneth Hagin called Redeem from the Curse. Back then, these little books only cost 50 cents each. And we bought every one of them that we could. And I'd study them day and night. And... Uh, uh, then I was introduced to the ministry of Oral Roberts. And I began to get everything Oral Roberts had. That led to the ministry of T.L. Osborne. I got everything I could find from T.L. Osborne. And even though I'm sitting in a bedroom in my home, Kenneth Copeland, even though I'd never met any of these men, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Oral Roberts, and T.L. Osborne became my mentors. They didn't know they were mentoring me. 
but they became my mentors. And one of the things that they all seemed to emphasize was our covenant with God. And so that became a, a, a thrust for me. It became something that I was going to spend hours and hours upon each day studying. And here it is 44 years later, and I'm still studying it. And I'm still learning. And I'm still receiving revelation knowledge. I've discovered that the Word of God is inexhaustible. Just about the time you think you know everything there is to know about one verse, go read it again. You'll find out there's so much more. I love what Kenneth Hagin used to say. And, of course, over the years I got to know these men, got to preach with these men, and, and became co-laborers with them. And uh, uh, I remember being with Brother Hagin on numerous occasions. And it was not surprising sometimes when someone would come up to Brother Hagin and say to him, Brother Hagin, every time I've ever heard you, you preach the same thing. When are you going to preach something new? He said, when you get this, we'll move on to something new. <laughs> and he said that for 60 years. Right. You know, uh, I had the Spirit of God say to me not too long ago, because one of the greatest revelations I've ever received in all these years is the revelation of how to walk in the favor of God. And if there's any one thing I believe the body of Christ needs to learn how to do in the time in which we're living is learn how to walk in God's favor. Because the favor of God can do what money can't do, what power can't do, what influence can't do. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, if you ever have a choice between silver and gold and loving favor, choose favor. And I have learned to rely upon the favor of God every day of my life. And it has gotten me over, gotten me through, and made me a winner after year after year after year. And God's no respecter of persons. Can you say amen? How many of you want God's best? Amen. Well, the Lord said to me not too long ago. He said, don't ever stop teaching my people on my favor. I said, Lord, I've been teaching it for over 40 years. He said, yeah, you're about to get a hold of it now, so just keep teaching it. Well, I've written a number of books on the favor of God, preached a number of sermons on the favor of God until it has become one of the characteristics of our ministry. It's, our ministry is known all over the world for the favor of God that's on it. I'm known all over the world personally for the favor of God that's on my life. Gloria Copeland has said many times, Jerry, I've never met anybody in my life that walks in more favor than you do. Well, it's something I've studied and I've, I've practiced and, and I keep studying and it keeps showing up, praise God. In fact, in many places where I speak, they will introduce me as, let's welcome Dr. Favor <laughs> or Mr. Favor. I'm telling you, the favor of God is invaluable. And I want to talk to you about the favor of God today. So let's begin in Psalm 5, and let's look at verse 12. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Now, I want you to notice two specific words in that verse. The first one is bless, and the second is favor. I want to say this to you. You can't have the blessing of God on your life without the favor of God right along with it. The favor of God and the blessing of God are divine, divinely connected. If you see someone in the Bible who's operating in the blessing of God, you're also going to see the favor of God in their life. They're inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And here it says that the Lord will bless the righteous. Thank God we're the righteousness of God through what Jesus did at Calvary. I'm not righteous based on something I've done. I'm righteous based on what Jesus did. In fact, in the Old Testament, it says there's none righteous. No, not one. Well, that's why Jesus went to the cross. Because there was none righteous. No, not one. The Old Testament also says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's why Jesus went to the cross. I'm not declaring my righteousness today. I'm declaring His righteousness today. Praise God. 
The Bible says that he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. If you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then you have every right to say without any reservation, without any hesitation, I am the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Somebody say it with me. I am the righteousness of God. Look at the person next to you and say, how does it feel sitting next to somebody who's righteous? <laughs> Amen. Now, righteousness is really an old English word that simply means right standing. That's all righteousness is. It's not some goody-goody attitude. Righteousness means right standing. And you and I have right standing with God. I love that. I tell you, that puts a smile on my face when I get up in the morning. It puts a smile on my face when I go to bed at night. Knowing that I have right standing with the creator of the universe. I'm telling you, it's exciting to know that God is not mad at you. <laughs> Amen. And you'd be surprised at the number of Christians around the world who do not know that. They think God's against them. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that God is for us. And if God is for us, no one can successfully be our enemy. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them, God's for you, not against you. Amen. And notice it says here that he will bless the righteous. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm blessed. See, I don't go around saying one of these days I'm going to be blessed. Because if I said one of these days I'm going to be blessed, then I would be saying that the Word of God's not true. It says He blesses the righteous. And I am the righteous based on what Jesus did at Calvary. So therefore, I am blessed. Say it again. I am blessed. Say the blessing of God is on my life. And give the Lord a good shout for it. Amen. Amen. Now, look at Psalm 3. Verse 8 says, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. How many of you are the people of God? Then His blessing is on you. Not when you get to heaven. You're not going to need the blessing on you when you get to heaven. Where you need the blessing is down here. Can you say amen? amen? You're not going to have any opposition in heaven. You're not going to struggle in heaven. There are no tests and trials in heaven. There is no adversary in heaven. You have heard the devil's not going. That's good news. Amen. Where you need the blessing is down here. And it says very clearly, the blessing is on his people. And notice that little word at the end of that verse, Selah, which means stop and think about this. Yes. Hallelujah. Stop and think about it. His blessing is upon you. But notice also in verse 12 of Psalm 5, he not only confers his blessing upon us, but it also says, and with favor wilt thou compass him or surround him as a shield. I not only have God's blessing on my life, I am surrounded by His favor. It surrounds me like a shield. That means that everywhere I go, I can rely upon the blessing of God and the favor of God to go with me. Hallelujah. Everything I do, I can rely upon the blessing of God and the favor of God getting me over, praise God. That's the reason... There's no fear in my life. That's the reason I'm worry-free. Thank God it's a good way to live when you don't have to worry about anything. Amen? Don't worry about anything. Not fearful of anything. Why would I worry when I have the blessing of God on my life? Why would I fear when His favor surrounds me? I like to do it like this. It's like a wall. And it surrounds me, praise God. In fact, today when you walk out of here, walk out of here doing this. 
I dare you to go to work tomorrow and walk in that place of employment and go. Make them wonder, what are you doing? And just tell them, you ought to have been in church yesterday. And just keep going. <laughs> Amen. I have this wall of favor around me. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, let's talk about the blessing a little more. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Because I want to talk to you this morning about the power of the blessing and the effect of God's favor. The power of the blessing... And the effect of God's favor. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God has introduced himself to a man by the name of Abram. Later changed his name to Abraham. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will Bless thee. I will bless thee. Now, the blessing is an empowerment. It is an empowerment. It is something that God conferred upon Abraham. Now, we later find out that it didn't end with Abraham because God promised later in Genesis chapter 17 that he would not only pronounce and confer this blessing on Abraham, but it would be on his seed after him. And then it goes on to say, which would mean beyond Isaac and Jacob, it says, and he will place this blessing upon his seed after him in their generation. Now we know this same blessing that was on Abraham was on his seed Isaac and on his seed Jacob. But then it says, and it will be on the seed of Abraham in their generations. And if you pick up on this in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says in verse uh, 13 all the way down to verse 29, he said, and if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Can you say amen? That means if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, then God considers you one of Abraham's seed. Meaning the same blessing that he pronounced on Abraham is now on you. Hallelujah. I think you ought to give the Lord a shout over that. Praise God. Amen. Now if you don't shout when I ask you to shout, we'll ask you to leave the room. No, I'm kidding. I like shouting. Praise God. You know, when these horse races are going on out here, there's people shouting. You know, they're they're fanatical about a horse. And you mean I can't shout over my God? I'm I'm fanatical about His Word. Hallelujah. Amen. A horse running around a track excites them. The blessing of God on my life excites me. Hallelujah. Amen. So if I get to shouting too much, Just excuse me, and I'll settle down when I can, praise God. But this is exciting. This is life-changing. Can you say amen? Amen. So notice here, he says, I will bless thee. I will bless thee. How does God bless someone? He, He does it by speaking it. And that would mean that he confers it upon them. You know... In, in my part of the world, in America, we don't, we don't understand. The Western mind doesn't understand confer like you folks here do. Because you see it. The queen confers a title on someone. You know, uh, when William and Kate married. I mean, you know, America was watching all of this. We're intrigued by all of this, you know. Royalty. And when William and Kate married, notice a title was conferred upon her. She wasn't born with that title. She didn't earn that title. It was conferred upon her. She's now called what? The Duchess of Cambridge. She wasn't born with that title. 
She couldn't do anything to earn that title. It was conferred upon her because she married the prince. And now she is the Duchess of Cambridge. I wasn't born with the blessing of God on my life. There's certainly nothing I could do to earn the blessing of God. But one day I bowed my knee and said, Jesus is Lord. And in the spirit realm, God took the scepter of righteousness and laid it on my shoulder and gave me a title. And my new title is Jerry the Blessed. Hallelujah. Go ahead and touch me if you'd like to. It'll be all right. Huh? I'm Jerry the Blessed One. Hallelujah. Chris the Blessed One. Carolyn the Blessed One. So you ought to see yourself that way. See, this is not just a sermon to me. This is life. This is the way I live 24-7. I'm the blessed of God. It's been conferred upon me through what Jesus did at Calvary. It's been conferred upon you through what Jesus did at Calvary. Now, the blessing is not some kind of religious cliche that we use to greet one another when we come to church and the way we say goodbye to one another when we leave. Bless you. Bless you too. See you next Sunday. Okay, bless you. That's about as deep as the revelation goes with most Christians. Or when they sneeze. Bless you. Where do we ever get that? That's about the only time in some Christians' home you hear the word bless is when one of them sneezes. Bless you. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I learned 44 years ago that the blessing of God is not some religious cliche or just a religious greeting, that it is an empowerment from heaven. It is the empowerment to prosper. It is the empowerment to succeed. It is the empowerment to increase. It is the empowerment to excel. And it is the empowerment to rise above what holds others back and keeps others down. That's what the blessing of God is designed to do. Now, let me prove it to you. Notice Genesis 12, 2, God says to Abram, I will bless thee. Go to chapter 13, one chapter later. Look at verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. God pronounced the blessing on him, and one chapter later, he's a rich and wealthy man. How many chapters will it take you? <laughs> Amen. Notice, there was the empowerment to prosper. The empowerment to increase. The empowerment to excel. And notice, it also says in verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation... I will bless thee, and I'll make your name great. In other translations, it says, I will cause your name to become distinguished. What was going to cause Abraham's name to become distinguished? The blessing that was on him. People knew there's something different about this man. There's something on this man. In fact, there was a time when... Uh, uh, some people would approach Abraham or Isaac or Jacob in, in their generation, and they would say things like that. We know the Lord is with you. We know His blessing is on you. And wherever they saw somebody with the blessing of God on them, they wanted in covenant with them. They wanted a contract with them because they could see God doing things in their lives that wasn't happening in their life, and they wanted into agreement. They wanted into a covenant with them. Amen. In fact, Laban said to Jacob one time, he said, when you first came to me, I had nothing. But since you're coming, it has increased 
abundantly. And Jacob agreed with him. He said, you're right. When I first came into your life, you had little, but it has increased. I call that increase by association. You associate with people in whom the blessing of God is on, and you're going to experience some of the increase that they experience, praise God. Amen. Notice the blessing of God that had been conferred upon Abram in a chapter later. It has already empowered him to prosper and to increase. Can you say amen? Now, if you have an amplified version, anybody have an amplified Bible here? So that you can verify that what I'm saying is so, and I'm not making this up to fix, you know, to go with my sermon. <laughs> An amplified Bible, it says, I will bless thee and give you an abundant increase of favors. So there again, we see you can't have the blessing without the favor. They're inseparable. Now, the blessing of God, once again, is an empowerment. An empowerment to prosper. Now, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Are you still here today? Look to your neighbor and say, you will be shouting before the service is over. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. What time do I quit here? Tonight is 6. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, lock the doors, folks. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And look at verse 18. Now remember, the blessing is the empowerment to prosper. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee the power to get wealth. What is that power he's referring to? It's the blessing. It is God who giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. So notice here he says, I'm the one who gives you the power to get wealth. What is this power? It is the blessing. The blessing is an empowerment from heaven. Now, to verify that, let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. And you'll find that it says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. The blessing. It didn't say God will make you rich. It said the blessing will. Of course, the blessing comes from God. So ultimately, He is the source. But notice it says, The blessing of God will make you rich. I love another translation that says, the blessing of God will produce a rich life. Hallelujah. Rich in everything. Rich in joy. Rich in peace. Rich in comfort. Rich in happiness. Amen. Along with financial blessing, praise God. Amen. That's what the blessing is empowered to do. So, notice once again, the blessing on Abraham's life empowered him to prosper, to succeed, to excel, and to increase. I was reading an exposition of the Holy Scripture book that I have in my library, and I came across this statement, and it said, Happy and fortunate is the life that God's commanded blessing is upon. Happy and fortunate is the life in which God's commanded blessing is upon. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 8, it says, The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee. I have God's commanded blessing on my life. You have God's commanded blessing on your life. The only difference in me and some of you, this is a revelation to me. It's something I walk in every day of my life. For some of you, you're just now finding it out. Or for some of you, you've known it, but you haven't pursued it like you should. You know, folks, it's one thing. To have something on you, it's something else to tap into it. Right. You know, Chris telling me his background in music and so forth, and, and obvious it's, it's passing on, you know, into the next generation. But, you know, people who have talents, musical talent, 
and giftings on the inside of them. They don't just surface. You know, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't become developed without them tapping into it. I wonder how many people there might be in here this morning who are musically inclined and gifted and yet will live their life never tapping into it. You understand what I'm saying? When, when, when I was growing up, my sister is uh, uh, not quite four years younger than me. And, of course, in, in America, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, you know, boys played baseball. I was an athlete all my young life. Baseball and other sports, but baseball was the sport I excelled in. And, and boys played baseball. Boys played football. Boys raced cars. Boys made noise. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, not in my neighborhood, didn't play pianos or violins. There was not a kid on our street that did that. He'd have been the laughing stock of our neighborhood. You know. But my sister wanted to learn to play the piano. And she told my mom and dad. Now, my mom and dad were not well off financially. My dad worked hard. We weren't poor. He kept food on the table. He kept clothes on our back. He worked hard for every dime he got. So there wasn't a lot of extra for frivolous things, you know. And so she wanted to learn to play the piano. And so they sent her to take piano lessons. Well, she'd come home, you know, and they'd ask her how she did. And she said, fine. But she said, you know, at some point we need a piano here at the house where I can develop this. Well, you know, a piano, as far as my mom and dad were concerned, was an investment. We don't have money to put into something that's not going to be used, you know. And so they said, do you promise you will practice every day if we buy you a piano? Oh, I promise, <laughs> you know. I promise faithfully I will play the piano every day. So they gave in and they bought her a piano and they put it in our, in our main family room which was just a ways off from my bedroom. So I'm back there building model airplanes and, you know, reading about Mickey Mantle, the home run king, you know, in baseball. And she's in there practicing what she'd learned. Now, when my whole family would leave, I made sure the whole family left. I would slip in there and I made sure none of my friends, boys, were on their way to my house. I looked down the street both ways. I'd slip in there, and I would try to play what I heard my sister play. And if I stuck with it for a little while, I could do it. I thought, wow, I'm playing what I heard her play. Then I'd hear the family come. I'd shut that thing and run back in my bedroom and work on that airplane. I didn't want them catching me in there on that piano. <laughs> Especially not my best friend who lived across the street, Kenny Hennard. If Kenny ever saw me playing that piano, we would fight the rest of the day. Because he would have made fun of me. You know. And I would do that. They'd slip off and I'd do it. And then I'd start picking up a few songs on my own. <laughs> I'd think, look at this. I can play the piano. And then somebody come and I'd shut it and act like I hadn't, I hadn't even noticed it was in the room. Oh, we have a piano? <laughs> but one day, Kenny Hennard slipped over to my house and caught me. <laughs> and when he did, he started in. You, you, back then, the word they would use was sissy. You sissy, you play the piano. And I hit him in the nose, and we fought out of my house, out in the front yard, all the way to his house. <laughs> now, here it is. I'm almost 67 years old, and I think there's a gift down in there Amen. that has never been tapped into. And if I could find Kenny today, I'd hit him again. <laughs> I let something stupid... 
keep me from tapping into a gift. That's a sad story, but let me tell you something even more sad. Christians being lied to by religion. That God won't do this for you. God won't do that for you. And you'll never have this and you'll never have that. After all, who are you? You worm, you dog, you unworthy thing. And most Christians live their lives having this blessing of God on them. This empowerment on them. And never tapping into it. And live and die settling for far less than what they could have enjoyed. That's why I'm in the ministry today. My job is to stir this up in God's people and to teach them how to tap into it, praise God, so that they can live the kind of life that God intended for them to live. Let me also tell you this. The blessing on your life is not just about you living a good life just for your sake. The blessing on your life is to cause the world to eventually notice there's something different about you and eventually they will come to you and say, how are you doing this? Where are you getting all this? And you'll be able to say, it's the God I serve. It's His blessing on my life and it's His favor that I walk in. And now your very life becomes an evangelistic tool. I've won a lot of people to Christ that I never preached one word to. They just watch the way I live and want to know, how are you doing this? And that opened the door to lead them to Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Now, the blessing of God, and I want you to repeat this with me because I want you to get it into your heart. Say this, the blessing of God is the empowerment to prosper, to succeed. To increase, to, increase, to, multiply, to multiply, to excel, to, excel, to, rise, above. to rise above. That's what the blessing is. It is the empowerment to do those things. But you can't have the blessing without favor. So what is the real purpose of the favor of God? Now the Lord just pointed this out to me just a few weeks ago. After all of these years of preaching on favor, teaching on favor, walking in favor... I'd never said it quite like this before until just a few weeks ago. And I'm telling you, when the Lord said it to me, it took me to another level. Even though when He said it, I I was living it, I was operating in it, but I'd never said it in these exact words before. And He said this. He said, Son, if the blessing is the empowerment to prosper and succeed, what is favor? What's its primary purpose? I thought about it, and he said this. The favor of God produces the opportunities to make it happen. That's what the favor of God's for. To produce the opportunities for the empowerment to work. Now, it's one thing to have certain abilities, but if you never have opportunities to utilize them, then what profit are they? Amen. I think back home we copied or they brought to America a a TV program that started here called American Idol. What do you call it here? X Factor. And then it eventually became American Idol in America. Anybody ever heard of it? Top Idol. Okay. Pop Idol. Okay. Well, they brought it to America. I think it's the same guys, whatever his name is. Simon. 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 Y'all like Simon over here? Okay, never mind. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, they brought that program to America. Okay, it's a new thing. And all these people tried out, you know, to be on American Idol. Well, you, you've seen how they do it. And it got down to the finalist. And they got to be on American Idol. Well... The, the young lady who won the first season in America, her name is Kelly Clarkson. Okay? Kelly grew up less than five miles from where we live. And as a young lady, a teenager, she was working as a waitress in a little cafe 
in Burleson, Texas, which is the adjoining town to where we live in Crowley, Texas. I mean, you can throw a rock from our house and land in Burleson almost, you know. And here's this young lady over here with all this talent. And what is she doing? She's serving tables. Oh, she had been singing in other places growing up. But when American Idol came and they talked her into going and trying out and she made it to the finals and eventually won, has her life changed? Tremendously. In fact, I think she's one of the most successful ones uh, since they began the, the, the series there. I mean, she's still going strong. A lot of the others that won, we never even hear about them anymore. And she's become one of the most successful ones. What am I saying? When you have an ability, but then you're provided an opportunity, your life changes. Did you hear what I said? That's what the blessing of God and the favor of God are designed to do. To give you the empowerment to do what you cannot do on your own. And then the opportunities to make it happen. Amen. Amen. Uh, that, that is the story of my life over the last 44 years. I didn't know when I was sitting there in my grandmother's home in 1957 at a family reunion with all of my cousins and all of my relatives in my grandmother's tiny home. We're all standing around getting ready for lunch and somebody turned on my grandmother's old black and white Philco television set and the first image that came on and if you remember back in those days it took a while for the picture to come on. <laughs> and we're all, somebody turned on that old black and white television set and the first image that came on was Oral Roberts preaching under the big tent one of his most famous tent sermons called The Fourth Man. I'm standing there with my cousins on either side with a plate of food in my hand. And even though I'd never heard of Oral Roberts, many of my relatives had because they lived in Oklahoma. And most of them didn't like him. In fact, some of my uncles, I overheard them say, he's a fake. Those people were paid to get out of those wheelchairs. And I'm standing there with my eyes like this, watching this as a little boy, and I am captivated. And that's when I heard the call of God. I heard God say, someday you'll do that. You'll preach my gospel. You'll pray for the sick. You'll see the miraculous. And I thought it was one of my cousins talking to me. When I turned, they were all gone. And it scared me. And I never told anybody about it because I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to do that. And I thought if I ever tell anybody, I'll have to do it. So I never told anybody. And I pursued my dream instead of God's dream. My dream was to own an automotive business. And I did that with all of my heart until I couldn't run from God anymore. Now, let me ask you a question. What are the odds of an 11-year-old boy watching Oral Roberts on television in 1957, eventually sitting on his board of directors and he becoming one of my dearest friends and preach all over the world with him. What are the odds? You're the odds maker. <laughs> what are the odds? Too extreme. Too extreme. But one day, while I was preaching with Kenneth Copeland in one of his conventions in Charlotte, North Carolina, the last service, Brother Copeland, was to close out the convention. I'm sitting on the front row with my wife and Gloria and the other speakers. Brother Copeland got up to preach. And when he got up, he said, I'm not supposed to preach tonight. Jerry, you're supposed to close this out. Get on up here and preach. I didn't have a clue what I was going to preach. I'd preached all my sermons. But you don't argue with Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> you don't say, no. You do what the man says. And so I walked up there, and I didn't have a clue what I was going to preach. He pulled up a chair, sat right there that close to the podium, 
And I walked up to the podium. Still didn't know what I was going to preach. And so I just bowed my head for a moment and just opened my Bible, wondering where in the world am I going to go tonight? And it opened to the book of Daniel. And I heard coming out of me the sermon that I heard Oral Roberts preach when I was 11 years old on the fourth man. And I preached it just like him. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who he is. And I showed him the fourth man from Genesis to Revelation. And I'm telling you, when I got through, the power of God hit that place. I mean, the miraculous started happening. Brother Copeland jumped up, went to shout, and said to his television producer, I don't know what you got going on our program in the next few weeks, but whatever it is, cancel it and get this message Jerry just preached on our worldwide television broadcast. I mean, in a matter of 30 days, it had gone worldwide on a Sunday, on Monday, I get a call from Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association demanding that I be in his office tomorrow. I thought, they're going to sue me. They're going to sue me. <laughs> Plagiarism. I stole his sermon. <laughs> you know, I'd never met Oral Roberts before. I gave him credit. I told the people, I said, folks, I didn't know this was in me. I didn't know. That. I heard this sermon when I was 11 years old. This is all Robert's sermon. I, I know I'd said that. <laughs> so I get on the airplane and I fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I walk into his secretary's office, Ruth Rooks. And Ruth calls Brother Roberts and says, Jerry Savelle is in your office. I thought, okay, here we go. <laughs> tall doors. He opened those doors. He's a taller, bigger man than I thought he was. Ah, he looked like he's 12 foot tall to me. And he had his arms open like this and said, come here, my brother. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. I literally turned around and see who else came in the room. He said, no, you. I said, me? You've been wanting to meet me for a long time? He said, yes. I said, you don't know me. He said, well, I'm about to know you. He said, but I've heard for many years now. That you heard the call to preach as a little boy watching me on television. And I've been wanting to meet you. He said, come. So I walked up to him and he just took me into his bosom. And began to prophesy over me. And pray over me. And told me how much he loved and respected me. And then he pushed me up and said, follow me. I thought, okay, the lawyers are in here. <laughs> I went in his office and no one was there. He said, sit down. I sat next to him on his sofa there. And he said... I just had to have you come today. I, I said, why? He said, I saw you preach my message on Kenneth Copeland's broadcast yesterday. And he said, I was sitting there in my home with Evelyn. And I said, Evelyn, he reminds me of myself when I was a young man. He said, I've never heard him. I've never heard anybody preach it better than that except myself. <laughs> and that's what he told me. And he said, my dear brother, this is a divine appointment. And from that moment. There was a divine connection. Amen. Amen. He became my spiritual grandfather. Hallelujah. He and Evelyn came in our home, and we were in their home, and we preached together. Evelyn, Evelyn, when I would come into a crowd of preachers, I mean, there might be 2,000 preachers at ORU. And when Carolyn and I would get there, and Oral was standing right next to her, she'd say, move back, here comes my favorite preacher. <laughs> Oral said, your favorite preacher? What about me? I said, you too, but here comes Jerry. You know. <laughs> what are the odds of that? See, that's the favor of God. The association took my ministry to another level. See, there was this empowerment already on me. But favor opened an opportunity. And the opportunity... Brought increase. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Let me say this to you. I know our time slipping away here. I want to challenge you this morning to start making it a daily declaration. A daily confession that the favor of God empowers me to prosper. The, I'm sorry. The blessing of God empowers me to prosper. The favor of God provides the opportunities. Let me show you this with you. 
Over the years, one of the ways that, that God blessed Carolyn and I personally, financially, was in real estate. We're not real estate brokers. We don't sell real estate. We're not dealers. But he would just lead us to a piece of property from time to time. I was, I was coming home from work one day. And, and you had to go across the railroad track, turn to the left, go one block, and where we were leasing a home at the time was to the right. I'm coming home. I go across the railroad track. I'm getting ready to turn to the left. And the Spirit of God said, turn right. I said, Lord, I live to the left. He said, I know where you live. Turn right. I said, but Lord, I'm going home. I live to the left. He said, turn right. I turned right. He said, go one block. I went one block. He said, turn left. I turned left. And I drove down this road, this street, not having a clue why I'm here. He said, look to the right. And there was this little two-story Cape Cod-looking house. And he said, that's your house. I said, do the people in there know that's my house? <laughs> he said, it's for sale. And about that time, a man came out of the house and was driving a sign in the front yard for sale. He said, now go get your wife and come bring her back and show her. So I went, got Carolyn. I came back and said, I found her house. And we walked up there and the man uh, was a real estate broker. And I said, sir, I, I, I want to buy this house. He said, well, I'd love to sell it to you, but we already have a contract on it. There's already a buyer. I said, well, that's my house. <laughs> he said, well, how do you know it's your house? I said, God told me it's my house. <laughs> God told you? Yes. He said, well, I'm sorry. He said, uh, it's already for sale. I mean, it's already under contract. And I said, well, that's subject to change. He said, what do you mean subject to change? I said, Paul said, things which are seen are subject to change. I can see it. That's subject to change. He said, I don't understand that. I said, you don't have to. I understand it. And he said, well, I'm sorry. It's, it's already sold. I said, well, sir, that's my house. A few days later, he calls back and says, we don't understand this, but we think you had something to do with it. <laughs> he said, the people qualified, their loan went through, everything is in order, and we got ready to sign the papers and do the transfer of title. And they said, you know, this is not the house we're supposed to have. We don't know why, but we can't buy this house. And they backed out of it. He said, sir. I think this is your house. I said, I told you that's my house. <laughs> now, here's my point. See, the blessing of God empowers me to prosper. Amen. But the favor of God produces the opportunities. Amen. We bought that house. Now, my wife is gifted as an interior decorator. My wife could make tons of money as an interior decorator. She's been asked to do it. The Hagans had her to come and do her home, their home one time. She doesn't do it as a business, but she is amazing. She, she can take something that should be torn down and turn it into a showpiece. And she went in there. See, she has the gift, and I know how to believe God for the money. <laughs> <laughs> and with her gifting and my ability to believe God for the finances, she turned this thing into a showpiece. And we were there two years. And somebody came up and said, are you interested in selling this house? Well, no, not really. They said, we know what it's worth on the market. We will give you double. I said, you know, I got up this morning thinking this house was for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Doubled my investment. We took that money and we met this man who was building homes in a brand new development that was only one-sixth developed on a beautiful lake on the north side of Fort Worth. And we met him. Some people say, by chance. No, favors producing opportunities. And he wanted to build us a house. And so we took what we had made in that other house. And we put it into this new custom built home on the lake. Beautiful place. We loved it. We'd only been in there for a couple of years. And somebody came by. And said, we love your house. Is it for sale? Well, no, not really. Well, we'd like to buy it. 
And I was offered twice my investment in that house. I said, this house is for sale. <laughs> What's happening here? The blessing and the favor, the empowerment and the opportunity. And as it went on and on, God did that for us time and time again until we were able to build Carolyn's dream home. I have a dream garage. She has a dream home. <laughs> the garage is mine. The house is hers. <laughs> no, I get to live in it, you know. And it's paid for. Now, what does this show me? That the blessing is the empowerment to prosper. But what I need is opportunities. It's one thing. You, you can get a, an education with all this knowledge of financial investment. All this knowledge of how high finance operates. But if you never have the opportunity to use it, what good is all that education? I want to challenge you to start confessing every day. That I have the blessing of God on my life. It is the empowerment to prosper. And right along with that I have the favor of God on my life. And that's what produces the opportunities for the prosperity to come. Hallelujah. Yeah. Give the Lord a shout over that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God blessed us. Our ministry with a piece of property. 102 acres of land. That And you're going to, I know, even in America, this is a good deal. I know it's an extremely good deal here. 102 acres that I paid $200,000 cash for. And there's no way you could do it without the favor of God. In fact, once it came into my hands, developers started coming to my office wanting to know, how did you do this? You're not even a developer. You're a preacher. How did you get this land? We've been trying to get this land for years. I said, favor. No, really. How did you get it? I said, favor. They said, no, really. How did you? I said, favor. And that $200,000 investment eventually produced over $3 million. The empowerment to prosper and the opportunity to make it happen. Amen. Now, most of God's people are not tapping into this. They just believe whatever CNN tells them. Oh, bad economy, recession. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Woe is us. Woe is us. Shut up. <laughs> How about tapping into what God put on you? Now, let me say this to you. You're making me preach six sermons in one session. Okay. <laughs> let me say this to you. I like to say the favor of God causes me to always be in the right place at the right time. Amen. Isn't that what opportunity is all about? Being in the right place at the right time? Amen. So I want you to add to that confession that the blessing of God empowers me to prosper and the favor of God produces the opportunities to make it happen. Go right along with it. Add this to your confession. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You see, favor is all about being led by the Holy Ghost. How did I get that house that eventually turned into double investment, double investment, double investment until eventually we built our dream home and it's paid for? How did that all happen? Listening to the Holy Spirit. Turn right. Amen. Opportunity is being in the right place at the right time. And you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. So start decreeing when you get up in the morning. And don't just do it tomorrow because I'm asking you to do it today. Make it lifestyle. Amen. See, I have a lot of people say, I tried it, Brother Jerry, confessed for three days and nothing happened. Oh, you really hung in there, didn't you? You're the rock of Gibraltar, aren't you? Three days, you lasted. No, my Bible says, let them say continually. Amen. Amen. So start decreeing. The blessing of God empowers me to prosper. The favor of God produces the opportunities. And my steps are ordered by the Lord. And He causes me to always be in the right place at the right time.
That's the way Carolyn operates. She, she's the interior decorator, designer of all of our ministry offices and complex. And when she gets ready to build or remodel, she starts confessing that. And it's not uncommon. She'll go to some place and pick out all she wants and get ready to go up and pay for it. And they say, by the way, you hit it just on time. We're having a sale today, 50% off. That's not a coincidence. That's the favor of God. I like to say when you know how to operate in the favor of God, you can have the world's best and not have to pay the world's price. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a good shout today. Amen. Stand up with me if you will, please. I want to pray over you and I want to close it out with the prophetic word the Lord gave me for 2013. He said, you tell the people everywhere you preach, all over the world, That we have entered into a time of unprecedented favor. Unprecedented favor. Unprecedented would mean beyond anything we've ever experienced before. Now I've been walking in this for over 40 years. But since January this year, I've seen it go to another level. I've seen God do things with the favor of God in my life like I've never seen before. This is our time for unprecedented favor. Unprecedented opportunities. Don't let them pass you by. You know, I believe it was Thomas Edison that said one time, uh, opportunities often come in work clothes. Thank you for your enthusiasm. (laughs) We got Christians just sitting around. Oh, Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Put some legs to your faith. Amen. 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 Sometimes a God-given opportunity means you roll up your sleeves. And even though it may look like nothing at the moment, who knows what it could turn into. My, my My youngest daughter's husband, Rodney, he worked for me in the ministry. But on the weekends, he, he saw that these video games from this is back a number of years ago. These video games, you know, that they put in amusement places and like Pac-Man and all that stuff way back then. And he saw there was one for sale in, in the newspaper and it needed repairing. And he got it for a low price, brought it back to his little garage at his house and, and repaired it and listed it for sale. Somebody bought it and he made a good profit from it. He took that and put it into two more. And made a good profit from them. He eventually became. In fact I told him. I said Rodney. You don't need to be working here anymore. You have an entrepreneurial spirit on you. You go make tons of money. And just tithe to your father-in-law's ministry. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) Amen. And he does. Hallelujah. Eventually something that started out. As just a little thing on the side. He became the number one distributor. Of video games in the state of Texas. And in the southwest. An opportunity. Now, I don't think we'd have that testimony today if he just said, No, Lord, if you want me to prosper, have somebody bring that game over to my house. Have somebody else repair it and just let me make the money. That's not the way it works. This is your time, ladies and gentlemen, for opportunities like you've never seen before. Be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. God may be about to open a door for you in which you have no expertise, you have no training, you have no knowledge of that field, but because the favor of God's on your life, God can take you and put you in that field and cause you to excel at it and never even have studied it before. How can God do that? Well, that's how you get to be called God. See, if you can't do anything and everything, you don't get to be called God. He's God because nothing is impossible to God. How many of you need some opportunities today? Lift up both hands. If you could, I'd ask you to lift up both feet right along with them. Now listen to me. Keep the hands up. You already have the empowerment. Don't ask God for the empowerment again. You already have it. His blessing is upon His people. What you need is opportunities. Father, I've declared your word this morning, and I'm asking you to confirm this word with signs following. 
And I'm asking you to provide unprecedented opportunities for your people to prosper, to multiply, to increase, to excel, and to rise above. Lord, I believe that the Holy Spirit that is in them is going to lead and guide them. Their steps are ordered by Him, and they'll be in the right place at the right time. And Lord, not only that, but you told me to tell people everywhere that this is the most important part. When it happens, acknowledge God. The moment it happens, say, that was the favor of God. And I pray in Jesus' name that there will be many testimonies from this service this morning of blessing and favor causing your people to rise and to go to another level. And it eventually caused others to want to know, how are they doing it? And they can say, it's the God I serve. Give Him a good shout this morning. Amen? Come on, give Him your best shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You received that this morning? Glory to God. Look at somebody and tell them. Opportunities are coming your way. The favor of God is producing them. Receive it and expect it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Chris back. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Isha, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.